Okay, we are live with, I'm going to say Dr. Mike Moffat. I don't know if you use doctor in front of your that, name. That's, yeah, sure. Go go ahead. That, that works for me. Yeah, Dr. Mike Moffat. And your bio, is, am I saying your last name properly? For Moffat. Example? Yep, yep. Moffat. Yep. And uh, your bio is uh, diverse and long. So I was, instead of me cherry picking off what you've been up to in your life so far, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about yourself and cherry pick some of the highlights. Because if you go through everything that you've been doing, we won't have time to ask you any questions about the population in Ontario, which is what we want to talk to you about. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, there's a, I mean, there a compliment, yeah, no. I mean, <laughs> I do wear a lot of hats. Yeah, not only a lot of hats, I, I live in a couple different cities. So uh, two big things I do. Uh, so first of all, I'm an assistant professor at Ivy Business School at Western University in London, Ontario, uh, where I was born and raised. Uh, I spent about 20% of my time there. Uh, and when I'm not teaching, I'm the senior director of research at the Smart Prosperity Institute, which is a think tank at University of Ottawa uh, that looks at any issue that intersects both the environment in the economy and you know that, that 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 is a big intersection so and housing is is one of those so done a lot of things in my career but that's uh that's what i do now so about 80 percent of my time in ottawa 20 percent of my time in london ontario and been doing a lot of uh, a lot of housing work over the last uh, few years i got uh my background is more historically and been issues around like international trade, economic development, regional economic development. But I got really interested in this subject back in 2017, actually, when I sold my house in, in London, Ontario, at a time where we had pretty much the highest unemployment rate in Canada or close to it. And we got a, and we got like 15 percent over asking. And I was just like, OK, as an economist, that doesn't make any sense, right? Like what, what's going on here? So it was kind of doing this uh, side of desk for a few years. And then, you know, during the pandemic, when everything exploded, it went from being about 5% of my job to about 95% these days. Yeah, got it. Okay. Yeah. I was just thinking when you sold your house, it was probably some I had Nick, I had this vision of some Toronto people coming out to London. Well, a lot of our yeah. clients actually um, are choosing to go to London back to where they have some family just because they can't afford in Toronto. So never mind the investor front of people buying rental properties in different areas around Ontario. London's growing, and I'm, I'm sure, as yeah. you know, you probably have some people going, friends going back home to London. That's what's yep. that's what we're seeing actively. Yeah, absolutely. So we go back to 2017. Um, so I, uh, we live close to, to the university. We lived in a neighborhood called Old North, uh, far enough away that it's more townies than uh, than students, but you know, pretty close to that border. And yeah, it was uh, every every buyer who seriously kicked the tires or put an offer on the property, they were all from the GTA and they were all young couples. They either had young kids or uh, were very close to having, you know, a baby was on the way. So, you know, that was kind of a tell to me. It's like, okay, there's, there's something going on here. There's, there is a migration happening across the province when, again, people are moving to a place like London, which at the time was really suffering economically. It still hadn't fully recovered uh, from the, the decline in manufacturing. But despite that, uh, you know, we had all these buyers bidding war. You know, at the time, I thought we made out like bandits. And now today, it probably oh, go for sure. two, two to three times what it did that. But at the time, we were very, very happy. Yeah, you're just making me think when I drive into London, sometimes I drive by some of the old manufacturing type buildings. I think there yep. was an old Kellogg, a fairly yep. large Kellogg plant there driving by. And you just see this. It's like artifacts of you know a past that no longer exists. And it's kind of sometimes just, yeah, it's, it's shocking to see it. And, and um, you put in some, you put out some numbers. Um, I think it was in your last, it might've been the, the last big report you put out um, just about the families and the population of five-year-olds or five and under yeah. leaving the Toronto area. And I, I, I had never seen it looked at like that, um, which I thought was really interesting. So you put out some numbers showing that like over the last, I don't have the chart in front of me, number yeah. of years that the population of five and under year olds in the Toronto area has been dropping. And then you see the growth in the other areas. And, you know, the, you can assume that obviously, like you, you, you said, you're like, well, they're not leaving by themselves. So it was this kind of outflow of families from, from the, uh, from the city, which was really interesting that that was um, something unique that I don't think I had ever seen someone kind of splice the data that way before. Yeah, and it's, it's something we've been looking at as well. Uh, so if we go to the year before the pandemic, so so 2019 going into early 2020, we had about 60,000 people on net leave the city of Toronto and Peel region, so, so Mississauga and Brampton, for other, uh, other parts of the province. And 
you know, when you look at who they are, by far the biggest group is kids under the age of five and uh, parents by, you know, in that sort of 28 to 33 uh, cohort. And yeah, there's almost like this one to one relationship as the, the population of kids under the age of five is, is dropping, particularly in the city of Toronto. You know, you're getting a one for one increase in all over the place in southern, southwestern Ontario. So Woodstock, Tilsonburg, uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Brantford and so on. So, you know, you've, you, you're really seeing uh, big differences in, in where these kids are growing up. And again, a lot of that is is driven by um, popula- um, house price uh, differentials. And again, that was all before the pandemic. Since the pandemic, that's only accelerated. Now that people have more money, can place more bids and, uh, you know, big, bigger, um, bigger need for uh, more space because of work from home. So what can you, I guess, uh- what can you tell us just Ontario as a whole? I think Nick, you're pulling that baby, uh, that yeah, yeah. report from Baby Needs a New Home, his report, yeah. Baby Needs a New Home, projecting Ontario's growing number of families and their housing needs, which is a, I, is a great report. Yeah, but and I, I've I, read, I, I mean, I think because you have a, mm. a, a, you've put up a number of different posts yep. as well on your site. And I, I've, I get confused because I, <laughs> sometimes I'm like, which one was this from? Because I go through and I've read them all. Like, yeah. I think you're- And the reports the, are the long. Sh- yeah. yeah, and, yeah. and I think they've, they, <laughs> they're so valuable. I don't think they've been shared widely and they, they haven't got the attention I think they deserve. And I see more and more um, you are getting some of that attention or, or the, the, the report, yeah. your reports getting that, that attention. But that's why, I mean, I've been through, I know the colors yeah. of your reports. I, see one <laughs> of your, I know I see one of the graphs. And I'm like, oh, I know, I know yeah. the source of that one is, you know, the orange and blue is like, that's yes. Yeah. Just, yeah. Well, so, well, especially because I, I, I use a special font called Lexend, which is designed for people with dyslexia. And I think I'm the only person oh, who wow. reads that report. Yeah. So because of that, I always know if something's mine or people know it's something because if you see, you know, there's a particular font I use in all of my graphs. So these things go viral and even people who haven't seen my report, they're like, oh, that's, that's one of Moffat's because I, re- I recognize the colors and the, the font. So I try to have my own style for that. And I'm, I'm delighted, you know, when, uh, you know, people cut and paste piece, pieces from the graph and they, they go viral. It's, it's fantastic. But yeah, I have the same problem as well. Like oftentimes I will look for something in a report I wrote. And I'm like, I know I wrote that in a report, but I don't know which, which one because <laughs> yeah. we've, been, we've been doing so many of them. So, so can you highlight then, I guess, for anyone listening to this, what stands out to you with regards to Ontario's population growth, either the trends you're seeing, you know, what, what is standing out to you right now for Ontario? You can talk about Canada or on Ontario specifically. What, what are you seeing that is like, wow? Yeah. So if we, if we go back to uh, uh, baby needs in a home. So Ontario used to grow by about 600 to 700,000 people every five years or like 120, 130, you know, and pretty consistently. And then all of a sudden in 2015, that jumped up to about 200,000 or a million people every five years. So you go, okay, well, what the heck is going on? Like, why why did we jump up so much? It was basically four big things. The first was increased immigration targets under the Trudeau government, but that's only responsible for about 15 to 20%. The next 15 to 20% was uh, the oil shock or the the oil collapse in 2015. Because what happened was basically a bunch of people who were living out west, they they moved back. But as well, new immigrants who historically would have gone to Alberta or maybe Saskatchewan said, nah, you know what, I'm going to go to the GTA instead. There's just more jobs there. 10% 10% was a bunch of other stuff, you know, increased uh, number of births, you know, fewer people moving to the United States uh, under under Trump, you know, so just a grab bag of stuff. But the 50%, the remaining 50% was an international student boom that looks to be continuing. And the thing to note about international students is that they often don't come here, graduate and leave, and they never really intend to, right? That, oh, Over the last 10 to 15 years or so, we've made a number of reforms to how international student programs work, and they're all actually designed to keep people here. That in We've always had problems in Canada with uh, foreign credential recognition, right? So somebody, they're 28, 29 years old, they graduate from some university in Afghanistan that nobody's ever heard from, they try and become a doctor, and it doesn't work, and they end up driving a cab or running a pizza pizza, and it just doesn't work for anyone. So the government recognized about 15 years ago, and said, okay, well, instead of bringing people over at 28 or 29, why not bring them over at 18 or 19? They can get their degree or diploma here, they can work after graduation, um, and then apply for permanent residency. 
And the, there's no cap on that. You know, there's not like immigration where there's a, a cap or a target. The universities and colleges decide how many people they want to let in based on, you know, based on their criteria and, and things like that. So after 2015, uh, Ontario universities and colleges got very aggressive uh, with uh, recruiting from overseas. So it's caused this population increase. And not only that, so the people that we brought over 10 years ago who are 18 or 19, they're now, you know, they're now in their mid 20s to late 20s. They're, they're staying, they're starting to, uh, they're starting to have families. And, you know, it's, in May, it's, a, it's a really good thing in most ways, right? Like we're bringing all these bright, ambitious people over to contribute to our economy, to, to start families, but we haven't really increased the number of uh, homes we started. So that's a long winded way of saying that a lot of this is driven by international students, but we shouldn't think of them the same way we would normally think about students because they're largely here to stay. They're 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 coming over, intending to eventually immigrate to Canada. I think, I think gets we me spell- is that, that those numbers are never the non permanent resident numbers are never really spoken about in our immigration numbers because they're not included. Like I, I mean, yeah. I, the, I know yeah. the ones they stay if they stay afterwards, yeah. and they change their they go from non permanent residents to permanent residents. Those are included, but when that spike started. Um, it's funny, we took some data, we, we, map, we mapped that spike against, and I mean, I know there's more factors, but it, it lined up nicely where inventory started dropping and, and then because of the inventory dropping, spice, prices started accelerating at a faster pace. Um, obviously low rates and, and easy money changed that, but uh, they line up well. And, and, it's, and so, so it, you know, it just kind of backs up your point, but like, why is that, you know, why is that not spoken about anywhere? Like why everyone talks about this immigration target of 400,000 and that's great, but no one talks about these non-permanent resident numbers really like in, in the mainstream media where that you see. Yeah, and I, I, I don't really understand why. I actually think it's poorly understood even by policymakers. And a part of what I do, try and do in my job is, is talk to uh, municipal councils, talk to mayors, talk to provincial and, and federal policymakers. Cause you're right, it's not understood that you know because people think oh well they're they're international they're counted in the immigration numbers it's like no they're not because the immigration numbers it's a specific you know class of individuals it's a specific target but here you know they're 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 considered non-permanent residents and i think the the term itself is problematic because policymakers and others here oh well they're not permanent residents okay well they're not here to say and so it, it's uh you know it's it, it, as we say monetary policy like it's a transitory thing and you hear that inflation oh well this population is transitory i think of them more as pre-permanent residents right that that they're not they haven't achieved permanent residency but they're on the path to so i think we get uh, a little bit misled by our terminology i think that causes policymakers uh to uh you know not understand the situation but i think as well because there's not a target you actually have to go out and do that legwork to figure out you know how many international students there are and that kind of thing where you know because our immigration system runs on targets we not only know how much how many approximately we have now but how many we're going to have a year or two from now um I couldn't tell you how many international students we're going to have two years from now. I would literally have to call up every college and university uh, in, in the province or the country and say, "Okay, what, what what are your enrollment targets?" And you know, half of them are going to treat that as as you know proprietary information anyway and not give it to me. So there's a real lack of transparency. There's a lack of data, but there's also this lack of understanding just because of the the, the terminology that that we use to to describe this population. Yeah, I never thought that it's not transparent, Nick, because what Mike just shared is accurate. Yeah, why would the university even, they can choose just not to share that information. And we saw some data, Mike, I don't know if it was yours or not, but it was the first two months of this year, I set, I think set new records yeah. for study permits or you know the non-permanent yeah. residents under the student classification. So to me, that means the universities and colleges are just like, okay, we're yeah. just going to keep doing this. But I really never thought of it that way until you just said this, that it's almost like this opaque thing where they have the opportunity to do it, but the country itself doesn't really know how many people we're bringing on here. And just so you know, our business, we hired somebody, Nick, you, you know who I'm talking about. She was here, went to school, got a job with us, and then was looking for permanent status here in Canada to stay here in Canada. So what you're saying, Mike, not only do we agree, we saw it firsthand. Yeah. 
right? Where she came into school here and decided she was staying here um, in the country and then needed housing. But that number, she was never really counted anywhere. And yeah, then- no, no, absolutely. And that, that happens a lot of times. So you're right that you'll get the permit data, but that's that's backwards looking, right? That, that after once there have been accepted that uh, you, 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 you get this from uh, immigration and ref- IRCC, I can never remember acronyms, they will they will post that data. But that's after the fact, right? So it's like, oh, okay, I guess this is, you know, this is the, the sort of population. So that's really hard for like, if you're a, a municipal planner, to go, okay, how much, how much do we need on housing and how much should we be lobbying the provincial government to build more student housing and those kinds of things when all the data that you have is, is backwards looking. And furthermore, uh, you know, it takes a long time. <laughs> Obviously, you can't build a house overnight. You can't build a student residence overnight. So, you know, not only do you kind of have imperfect information about what's happening on the ground now, you're really in the dark about where things are going to be five years from now, which makes it incredibly difficult uh, in you know, in a planning environment. So let's, and, and, if we look at this, because this is one question I, I, I had always looking at, the, at this data, because we've seen obviously the huge increase in, in demand just from transactions in, in real estate over the same period of time with this population growth at non, more, larger non permanent residents, primarily students. What percentage of them like are buying these properties? So I'm just talking yeah. out loud here, you yeah, know, yeah. because if they're not buying the properties, it means then that they're just renting other properties. It, so there's the, the higher demand for rentals to be on the market, which then removes that supply from the real estate market. Is yeah. it like, I'm just in my head, I always kind of play that out. Like, I know this is what's happening, but I'm like, how exactly is it impacting it? There's a small percentage that are buying properties. Yeah. And then it's the, and then there's the other percentage that need the rentals that then investors will buy to rent out to them that removes that from the housing, the, the, the housing stock. Yeah, and that that's just it. Yeah, that that either way, either the international students are buying it, and that that does happen. And that I mean, that's always again. I'm I'm from London, Ontario, and we've always had traditionally, you know, rich families come in from Toronto, buy a place for their kid. Uh, and then sell it four <laughs> years later when they leave. Well, now, you know, they're not just coming from Toronto, they're coming from Taiwan or wherever, wherever else, right? But it's the same sort of dynamics. But as well, you know, you also just in general get more demand uh, for for rental stock. So you get, uh, you know, domestic investors and others going, well, this looks like a really good market. And I always joke, uh, you know, so, uh, so in, in near near Western or near Fanshawe, that that line where the students start, you know, the students end in the townies start, that moves a half a block or a block every, every yeah, year. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, though, the one part that people really miss is where the enrollment growth is highest is actually in the colleges, not the universities that we tend to think of the higher ed side on. But but it's your. Um, it's your Fanshawe's, uh, you know, it's your uh, Humber. Humber, Seneca, uh, all of those that are growing even even faster. Um, so that's where the growth comes in. So so you're losing uh, you're losing a lot of single detached homes. You're losing a lot of, you know, family housing stocks to student rentals. And, you know, obviously the students need somewhere to live. Right. So it's not you know, you, you can't sort of say, OK, well, that's not appropriate because it's like they've got to live somewhere. But you know, we're not necessarily building the the housing to replace the ones that are getting converted to student housing. So it just, you know, all what happens on the student market absolutely affects all of these other markets as well. They're all they're all interconnected, and you can't you, know, you can't just look at these things in isolation. So you've looked at this long enough now because we've been scratching our heads as to why there's not more coordination between municipal, provincial, and federal, and I, I, maybe that's just bureaucracy. Yeah. But you've been looking at this long enough. What's the solution? Like what you must be thinking like, okay, listen, yeah. here's what we need to do. What, what, what comes to mind? Well, I think first of all, that's ex- exactly it, that, that coordination. And, I, I, and I'd add a, a fourth actor to that, the higher ed sector, um, that br- bringing them in a, a, as well. So I think we need reforms there because absolutely like we had um, in, in Ontario, we, over the years, we, we've had our, our growth plan for the greater Toronto area, uh, Horseshoe area, or whatever they call it. Um, yeah, it's always changing. Yeah, yeah it's GTAH, GTHA, <laughs> but, but the, the growth plan. Um, you know, back in, in, in uh, 2005, we had the original one, it's been updated, and then we had a big revision back in 2017. Mm. And we did a whole report on this called Forecast for Failure where for whatever reason, and I still cannot figure out why, when the provincial government revised the, that growth plan, they 
took into account none of this population growth. It didn't show up anywhere. They used population forecasts that were three to four years old before the international student boom. So it was partly like a lack of coordination, but it was also just a lack of awareness of what was happening on the ground. That a lot of times when we, when you have planners or forecasters, they basically extrapolate out past trends, right? So they go, okay, well, we've always grown at about 600,000 people a year or every five years. So let's just extrapolate that into the future. They didn't really uh, incorporate these changes that the, the, the higher ed sector was making and the federal government was making. So I think, you know, first of all, just paying more attention to what your other levels of government are doing, more coordination certainly helps but i think there's other things we can do as well like one thing i would love to, is a requirement for every college and university to post their five-year enrollment plans say this is what we're going to do i would love right now our federal government basically gives us uh updates the immigration targets every you know they give us like 18 months so they'll say okay this is you know so in 2022 we'll issue a target for 2024. Well, it takes more than 18 months to build a house. So why not have a five-year target? Go, okay, we're gonna issue a target for every five years. And we know that governments might change and they might alter these things, but at least it gives us a baseline. At least it sort of says, okay, this is what we see happening on the ground. So if we had better data, if we had governments that could commit to more than 12 or 18 months in advance and more transparency, I think it would help us avoid the situation. Now, it's not going to fix all the problems we have, but what it will do is avoid us getting into a, a, a situation like this in the future. And, and something else just always comes to mind for me, and I, I don't have any evidence of this, but I just think if I'm a student here legally with a Canadian bank account, if my family overseas somewhere has money, I now legally have a proper way to yeah. funnel money into Canada that really nobody can argue with that I'm aware of because it's I'm a I have legal status here in Canada and if someone's going to put money in my bank account from overseas where I can go buy a house for cash let's say I mean it seems possible I don't know why it wouldn't be possible yeah. so well, it opens so up this other avenue of cash flowing in here too no am I missing well, it? yeah no it, well it, it does and it, it's it's funny because we've had, particularly on British Columbia, uh, but other parts of Canada as well, we get governments to decide, okay, you know, we need to crack down on foreign investment. We've got too much foreign money coming in, so here's our rules. And what happens is that they catch a lot of things uh, that, that are in good faith that, that the kind of investments you want to make so uh you know i i can speak to the higher ed sector again so what was happening was that the british columbia government was again cracking down on this and it made it like impossible for ubc and uvic to hire uh hire professors who let's say they graduated from like stanford in the united states and they now they you know they, they want them to go teach at ubc and ubc saying okay well you can come in but you can't buy a house and you're like well no you don't want to you don't want to crack down on that. So then all of these exemptions start coming into place because you need them. Otherwise, you're going to, you know, chase away uh, people that you want to come from Canada. And then you, you've got this kind of Swiss cheese type approach. So so I think ultimately, you know, I think there are things that you can do to uh, reduce speculative demand. And I don't think they're all bad ideas, but all of them deal with the symptoms of the problem which is just there's there's uh, too many uh, there's not enough houses for for the population um, you know so I think you need to deal with those underlying dynamics and then you know if there are any sort of bad faith actors you know because obviously like you you don't want money laundering right I think we can all sort of agree on that so you know having strong anti-money laundering laws is a good idea and there's further we can go on that you know the issues like beneficial ownership and stuff like that so I think there's stuff we can do there but we have to address the the core under underlying shortages. It just seems yeah. like there's no, it's, it's like the lack of communication or almost thought. It always seems like it's a Band-Aid solution over Band-Aid solution. <clears throat> Excuse me, just because, just like what you said about foreign ownership, with no buyer registry about beneficial, with beneficial owner, a lot of those foreign ownership rules or the foreign investors, it just doesn't, it just doesn't hold the same weight, right? Because like you, there's yeah. all sorts, from my understanding, it seems like it's a, there's pretty easy ways around those rules right now through, you know, corp Canadian corporations, if you yeah. want to kind of take that, 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 that route. 
Yeah, I think it was like the Beaverton or somebody that said that you know, New World's cracked down on those lazy and too lazy not to open up a numbered corporation. So, so, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, that there are, uh, you know, there are so many other avenues that you could go down that, you know, okay, is this, is this really going to be yeah. transformative? That it's like, okay, you, you, you sort of plug one loophole and then just an, another one develops. Yeah. Do you look at the supply side of things at all? Like we, yeah. we recently, we were uh, a couple of weeks ago talking to uh, uh, someone that does a lot of financing for um, a, a number of big developers around the, yeah. the GTA. And, you know, what he was sharing was just like, look, there's, there's so many challenges to get this new product to the market. And now with, you know, just the, the inflation cost of, of goods and then now with the labor strike, he's like, Look, well, like developmental costs in the city, Nick, the yeah, development costs in the city. Because, you know, the, the the question really was like with with this much, it's obvious that there's this strong demand. There's a track record of strong demand now. Why are why isn't there more product on the market? Right. And it's just like, the, you know, his opinion was, especially from the single family side, he goes, guys, it's just it's not nearly as easy as you think. It's not these greedy because these yeah. developers don't line their pockets if they want to. But he's like, it's just not possible. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we did, again, another report called The Growth of London Outside of London, looking at looking at London, Ontario. Um, and, you know, what, what's happening in my hometown is that the, the, the rules that have been set up by the municipality, they make it hard to build up, right? There's not, you know, you know it's very... You know, they have like, for instance, they have this growth area for downtown where all the high rises can go and it like covers about a third of downtown. Like it doesn't even if you know London, it doesn't even cover all of Victoria Park. So so it's very tight restriction. The, like they want infill, but they make it incredibly difficult. And then they have a tight urban growth boundary to prevent sprawl, or at least in theory to prevent sprawl. So what, what's happening is like you can't build up. You can't build out for the most part, except in, in some isolated pockets. So what the what the home builders and developers are doing is just going, okay, well, I'm just I'll just build right outside of city limits. Like if London doesn't want my money, I'll go to Lucan or Kamoka or or somewhere else. And you know, you, you get the kind of worst of all worlds because you're not helping the sprawl situation because all those people who are moving out to the county, they're still working in the city, they're still shopping in the city, they're still going to school in the city. So you're not you're making the sprawl situation worse. Uh, you're killing municipal finances because now all of those families are are paying their uh, you know the development charges go to those small towns, the municipal taxes go to those small towns. But they're all using London infrastructure and they're not paying the city of London a dime as far as uh, property taxes go. So so I think we need to look at these things and look at them a little bit holistically because you're right. You know, you see, um, you know, you see property developers are like, you know, I would gladly build it, you know, but it's like every time I try and build an, a, an apartment building, uh, you, you know, it's just the, the, the zoning's wrong or, you know, go through this process and uh you know we're like oh, okay well that's that's nine yeah. stories can you make it five and oh it casts a shadow three percent of the year on, on on some piece of land it's it's just ridiculous so yeah we we have all of these rules and again some of which are well-meaning you know i i am like 100 percent anti-sprawl but if you're just pushing development out of the county I don't see how you can say that our current system is reducing sprawl. In my mind, it's in many cases, it's making it worse. I feel like a lot of the rules make sense in isolation. Yeah. Right. But, but someone needs to come together. And it seems like from your conversations with different people that you don't see it happening either, because our, that's been always been our thought. Yeah. We're like, why? Well, you know, the communication can solve a lot of problems. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what do you think the chances like from, yeah. from where they kind of different, committees you've spoken to and the people yep. you've spoken to what do you think the chances are of that happening like is that yep. is that on someone's radar to be like hey why don't we like really yep. start to work all together on this thing yeah, well, I, I I think so, and I think ultimately, if anybody's going to solve this, it's going to be the province. Um, and I, I think the task force, uh, the the housing supply task force, the, the the Ford government put together, I think they recognize that because again, Matt, like imagine your Brantford, your Brantford City Council, and let's say you do all the right things on, uh, you know, on uh, on infill, you know, you get very you you liberalize zoning, you allow duplexes and triplexes by right, you do you know whatever. 
you're never going to solve the the housing supply issue in Brantford because all you're going to get is more families moving in from the GTA, right? Because we have 444 different municipalities, if one or two or three of the big cities screw things up, they wreck it for the other 440, right? So you need that coordination, I think, has to come from the province where they can set minimum standards. So they say, okay, you know, Toronto, Mississauga, Hamilton, Brantford, you know, Luke and Bidolf, you know, whoever. It's like, okay, these are the things, the minimum standards you need to have. These are the things that you need to, to do in order for the system to work as a whole. And then on top of that, then you can start to coordinate that with, you know, what's going on in the higher ed sector, what's going on with the federal government and immigration targets. I do think you need to address the labor supply issue, which is going to be a big one. And, and that has both a training component and an immigration component to it. But I do think the leadership has to come from the provinces. And, and, and as well that, you know, we've been talking about Ontario, you know, these aren't really that big an issue in Saskatchewan. You know, their their market's fine. Most of Manitoba is fine. You know, uh, Alberta, yeah, we've seen some price increases in, in Calgary area. But you know, I would also like in half the country, the real estate markets are working pretty well, right? You, 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 they're not, you know, yeah. you might you might have some increases, but they're, you know, they're functioning relatively okay. It's basically, it's like Southern Ontario, Southern Quebec, Lower Mainland, BC and Victoria, and I'd say Nova Scotia. Those ones are, are just broken, but other parts of the country are working well as well. So I think we want to avoid the federal government coming in with a one size fits all solution, which might work for Ontario, but it is overkill in, in Manitoba. It, the Nova Scotia one, I, I'm not yeah. as familiar with numbers out there. Is that from, from what you know, I don't know how familiar yeah. you are yeah. with it either. Is it people from other parts of the country that decided to either that maybe yeah. move from there and now they're going back because of affordability or they're going there for the first time because of affordability out that, that way? Yeah, so I don't I don't know the, the ratio uh, of which, but I do know it's you know, it's a combination of Canadians moving out there. Uh, and it was happening before the pandemic, but since the pandemic has about doubled sure. moving, moving to the Halifax area. And as well, uh, you know, Halifax has a lot of colleges and universities universities and they're kind of going through the same thing that the southern ontario is as well so their their market at least like the halifax dartmouth area looks a lot like a kitchener waterloo it's, it's basically has the the same dy dynamics of people moving in from the gta it's just a farther move uh and uh and the international student boom all right that's interesting do you uh, we've looked across north america to try to find out is anyone else kind of duplicating this issues that Toronto's or the Toronto area is having. And we, we were surprised to learn, Nick, I think it was last year or the year before Toronto was number one or three. I forget. It was like Dallas, Fort Worth. I forget who number two was. The and then it was Toronto. We... But then last year it was like Toronto was the highest population growth metropolitan center in North America. Yeah. When, when, with your research, did you notice any trends or anything across North America? Because I feel like this is something unique to this area here. I know there's pockets yep. across Canada, but yep. the growth in the greater Toronto Golden Horseshoe area seems pretty extreme right now. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely is. Uh, and again, most of that growth is not actually in the city itself. It's in like, you know, East yeah, Quillenberry. Sure. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, but I think that's, you know, it's Oshawa is growing. Like So yeah, absolutely. It's one of the fastest growing areas um, in, in North America. And again, a lot of that's the international student boom. And interesting Interestingly enough, they don't all necessarily go to U of T or the local colleges. So most of the, you know, kind of smelling money, most of the university or most of the colleges have actually put uh, satellite campuses in the GTA. Right. So, you know, Lambton College at Asarnia, they'll have their satellite campus uh in, in brampton or mississauga or toronto so that way when they recruit students uh the biggest source is, is from india but from other countries as well they don't know where sarnia is they're not necessarily wanting to go to Sarnia. i've been to sarnia many times i have a brother-in-law from brights grove i think it's lovely but you probably you know if you grew up in asia you probably never heard okay. of it but you probably have a cousin that that lives in brampton or Mississauga or, or, or Toronto. So we're seeing all of these satellite campuses uh, of uh, Ontario colleges open up in that area. And that is absolutely uh, contributing uh, to the, the population growth in, in that area. That That's where a lot of the international it. students are going. Such smart marketing, half of the Toronto location yeah. and then have the other locations spread it around. That's quite brilliant. 
I'll give so, it to them. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it is for sure. I, I'm just curious because you said something. So the population numbers, the, are the non-permanent residents or the student numbers, when we see these population number increases, those those people are included in our population numbers because they're not included in immigration numbers. As the yeah. hard population numbers, they are included in. Well, yeah. So so here's the and this is this is where the the, the data part gets particularly important. So there is uh, there are yearly population estimates uh, that Statistics Canada puts out at a at a at a local level. They are included in there, or at least they, they try to include them, but they are sort of estimates. Um, the census data, which comes out every five years, they're supposed to be included in that, but we know that they are less uh, international students and just non-permanent residents in general are less likely to fill out the census. So there tends to be, you know, and they're, they're, and they're supposed to, but they often, you know, they, they don't know the rules or think like, oh, okay, I'm just here temporarily. So the census numbers tend to have an undercount. And in particular, they tend to have an undercount in places with high uh, international student populations. And that leads to some, some bad analysis. And again, I think this is going to be uh, important for your listeners. So a lot of times you can get maps of um, uh, of of census data of what what they call sort of vacant homes or homes not occupied by usual residents, and that data is incredibly misleading because it just basically means nobody at that residence identified themselves to a census official as as being you know that being their their permanent residence. So either they filled out the census and they said, okay, no, I live, I live somewhere else. I'm just here temporarily. Or in many cases, they just didn't fill out the census at all. So to the census taker, it's a vacant property, but you can get really misled by that. And I think that's important if you're thinking of, you know, buying a property in those neighborhoods, you're going to think, oh, okay, well, these, you know, the census tells me that this neighborhood is 60% vacant. Like, why would I ever want to buy there? But it's incredibly misleading. And that's one of the things I try and tell my own research. Is, is like really understand what is being calculated, the method, it, you know, the method that's being used and so on, uh, because all of that matters. Like this, this data doesn't come to us from God via Moses. <laughs> you, you know, it's, it, it's all done by humans. And because of that, it's, you know, it's imperfect in a, in a variety of different ways. That was interesting because you wrote a report on that actually not it wasn't that long ago about the undercounting i believe of, yeah. of the students i remember reading it and i was like i had to go back i'm like let me read this again like what is what's he saying here so yeah and yeah. i forgot i actually forgot about that when i was asking the question but yeah that, yeah. Uh, that makes a lot of sense mike what's your just a couple more questions yeah. uh, for you uh what is your opinion on some of the data i think it was a bank of nova scotia report i think from this year and you've referenced different reports in your own research yeah. Nick, I'm refer thinking of the one that said Ontario would need, I think it's about 650,000 homes immediately to have the same housing per population units as the rest of Canada, yep. and a million immediately to have the same ratio as the rest of the G7. Do you remember that? Or did you see that report I, at all? And what was your thinking on it? Did you I, feel it was going like to and to add to that, but just before you answer, to add to that, because I was going to ask the same thing. I want a third, I want a third opinion on this one, because here's why. The Scotia report has us, and I, I have them up so I can share them, but the Scotia report has us last in the G7 um, yeah. as a, a, you know, homes per, pop, per thousand, thousand people in population. But then in the budget, the federal budget in 2022, they use the same numbers. And they use a, another graph and they put us against the OECD CT. and they're like, yeah. oh yeah, we don't have a problem after all. So Scotia said, and then BMO yeah, yeah. took that. So Scotia's yeah. like, we have a problem. And then BMO took the federal government and said, no, we don't have a problem. Look, we're right in the middle. And they, they actually bumped US right behind us. Yeah. All right. And then, so I'm looking for a third yeah, party so opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, so, 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 so actually this is a really good segue to, to where we were before because, uh, you know, how you define the population matters. So, so I think Scotia was using that one definition where they, the Statistics Canada was doing the estimate where they base it on, they base it on things like enrollment and, and change of, uh, change of address, uh, uh, letters with, uh, Canada Post and so on. Whereas the budget and BMO were using the census numbers with the undercount. So that's, again, you get in this like, okay, well, why are these things telling us conflicting things? So it's like, well, they're actually using different data sources. So this is, this is why this mattered. But the second thing, I did find the budget one funny and the BMO one funny, because they're like, 
well, we're, you know, we're about the same as the United States and Australia. And I'm like, okay, two of the most dysfunctional real estate markets <laughs> in the world. It's like, it's like, well, I, I don't do a lot of drugs, but compare me to Keith Richards. It's yeah. like, well, you know, may, maybe your comparison set is, is not the greatest, you, you know? So, so yeah, I, I look at that and it's like, okay, yeah, we're comparing ourselves to Australia, but you know, have, have you seen Australia's real yeah, estate yeah. market? It's not good. Yeah. So as far as the estimate goes, yeah, I think that, you know, somewhere in that, you know, 500 to 800,000 shortage, I, I think is a reasonable estimate. And I think ultimately the, the provincial government and federal government think so as well. So, you know, you go back to the housing task force, they've set a target of 1.5 million units over the next decade, which we only built about 700,000 the decade before. So that, you know, that gets you about your, your 800,000 uh, 800,000 differential. And the one thing I put up, would point out is that all four major provincial political parties have committed to that 1.5 million target. And I can't remember the, the same time the four of them agreed on anything, but they're all saying, yeah, you know what? We, we think, uh, we, we think the housing uh, task force uh, target is correct. Not necessarily doing enough to get us there, but uh, you know, first step is, you know, they all sort of recognize uh, the need uh, for, again, to, to build about eight, 700, 800,000 just to deal with population growth and then another 700 to 800,000 to, to basically play catch up for the last 20 to 30 years. But, did, but did, so I agree with you. And, and it was funny that you said that about New Zealand, and Australia, because this, we said the same thing when we looked at it. We're like, eh, so it, it's Canada and then the US and then the next two are New Zealand and Australia. Oh, sure, put okay. them in the middle of the pack. And we, we laugh. We're like, those two countries are like the yeah, last ones you want to compare those? yourselves to. They're right now <laughs> in the state, right? Um, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the thing that got me with the Housing Affordability Task Force, because I, I really feel like in the past, they looked at, I think it was Bill 164 way back. Yeah. They really looked at the private investor to try to help with affordable housing, right? Because yeah. they, want, they, they wanted to get, in my opinion, I was like, they, you know, they need these secondary suites. So they're going to force municipalities to allow these secondary suites. And that's what's going to, to, to increase housing yeah. stock. And right? it may kind of make sense. And one of the task force recommendations was to allow, you know, the third suites as well, if, yeah. you know, if there was room and that type of thing. And I'm like, yeah, it seems like they're going to turn to the private investor again. Yeah. But, but that was one that was kind of ignored, like that wasn't ignored or that's not in the platforms right now in the, the, the election, it seems like anywhere. And it seems like it's, it's not favorable a lot of, because a lot of people don't want it in their area or that type of thing. So I feel like a, a lot of that, ta a lot of, because the task force, the report made sense, at least to me, yeah. a lot of it made sense. And I feel like a, a bunch of it's already kind of just being overlooked or ignored. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So, I mean, the, the the Ford government did some of the reforms around, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you don't get your approval by a certain amount of time, you get your your your, your uh, approval fees refunded. You know, that that kind of thing. Like some of the smaller stuff, which municipalities still were not happy about. But but the bigger reforms around secondary suites, you know, duplexes and triplexes by right, they backed off on. But they they you know, Minister Clark said not no but just not yet the municipalities aren't there yet uh but we're, we're hoping to get them on board um and yeah even even from uh, like the liberals for instance you know the their platform doesn't say we will do this it, it uses softer language uh that uh, my colleague john mcgrath at tvo noted that you know again we will work with municipalities to enact these reforms okay well if the municipalities don't want to do it then i don't i'm not sure how you go there so uh, i'm hopeful again and i think many of these were i think the task force i was a little skeptical of the task force going into it uh, you know it was led by a banker i'm like okay this is Sure, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. this is this is just going to be Bay Street, um, you, you know, kind of doing their thing. But, you know, I think overall, I think they did a, a great job. Um, I'm hoping that the next government who comes in, whoever it is, says, you know what, this is necessary. We know it's not going to be hugely popular, but we'll take the hit now and yes. recognize that we have three and a half years to to recover from that. So I'm, I'm hopeful the next premier or the current one, if, if he's reelected, will uh, find some political courage and make these changes. The most interesting page on, on your reports, one of the most interesting yeah. ones, is Nick, page 29 of Mike's report there, which has five-year housing formations by some, compared side-by-side side to supply oh, yeah. in Ontario. Yeah. 
that to me is just like everything because when you see the housing formation sorry family yeah, formations formation. measured against housing supply to me it's telling me the next five years it's going to be really interesting in this area that we just have a lot we're going to continue have a, this lack of supply if you were to look into your magical crystal ball <laughs> Five years from now, where do you think we are? And, and pick any vector, like any data point you want, like price or supply or demand. Five years from now, where are we in the whole Southern Ontario, Golden Horse, however we want to define it? Where are we five years from today? Well, that's a good question. So I'm hoping five five years from today, uh, you know, we, we're at about 150,000 starts. I mean, that's where we need to be to, to, to hit our target, right? And like, for everyone listening, where are we now? Uh, we are about 98,000 last year, which was near record year. We had over the last decade, we had to average about 75,000. So that, that would be about double. So that's, we need to be about 150,000. I don't, I don't think we're going to get there, uh, just cause I don't think the municipalities are there. And then furthermore, we, we've got to build up the skilled trades and there's other issues, uh, you know, supply chain issues, but I think that's where we need to be. And, and, and with the variety of unit sizes that, you know, this can't just be, okay, we're going to, we're going to hit some arbitrary target by, by build, building a ton of high rise bachelor condos. Like we need those, but we, you know, that's not where the biggest shortages yeah. are. I'm not going to make any predictions on prices because prices are such a function of things like interest rates and things like that. And actually I would point out, this is actually my big concern. This is, if there's one thing that keeps me up at night, it's this. I worry that as interest rates go up, we have a correction in the market, kind of like you guys saw in 2017, right? When in, in the GTA, and then policymakers go, "Oh, I, I'm that that problem's over with." You know, they hang out the mission accomplished banner, uh, not recognizing that there are still so many structural issues. No pun intended with the uh, Southern Ontario housing market. So that is is my big big concern that if we do see a price correction, which you know is could could happen, I'm not saying it will, but it could. Um, that you know we 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 think like oh higher interest rates solved everything, but you know when you've got uh, you know when the number of families is increasing significantly faster than the number of homes you're going to have a, a shortage and if you ignore that problem you're just setting up the conditions for the next bubble it's, it's interesting that you say that because right now I, i'd say over the last month or so i've you know just a lot of people that we speak to there's kind of this differing of opinion that's like see yeah. i told you the housing wasn't about like supply the, there was no supply issue it's about rates rates matter rates are going up and you're seeing sales seeing sales yeah. slow and softening and some prices and stuff and the other people are like you know have a have the opposite of you and i think tom i think you agree with this our opinion is like why are you guys just arguing that it's one thing it's yeah. not one th the problem all, yeah the problem yeah. that caused the prices right now is there's been supply and demand issues and then the fuel on the and that yeah. like maybe that's some some inkling and they're a little fire and the fuel on the fire was low interest rates by the by the bank stats so the bank can lend more all this yeah. money into the system and so we're removing, you know, that part of the problem. And we overshot where, you know, historical appreciation rates just based on inflation and replacement yep. value, that type of stuff. We've overshot that tremendously. So maybe we come back more in line, yep. but there's a lot of underlying pressures that create some sort of floor there that then it continues over like, and then because the supply, the demand dynamics are out of whack, then we have the, the same kind of issue. We've just taken maybe the fuel off the fire for now. And if the, yep. rates, if the rates go up, if the rates go up too fast, and they're forced to reverse course because rates don't, the other thing people don't talk about is rates don't go up in a vacuum. Sure, yep. it impacts the housing market, but it impacts our borrowing costs and, and bondholders and bond prices and all this stuff. If they, you know, if that keeps happening, they got to look at maybe slowing down or reversing slightly, maybe sooner than people think. And then it, we're into this kind of this whole death spiral all over again. Well, well, exactly. Yeah. And I think fuel is the, the correct term for it, right? Like I, you know, I, I think of uh, that money as an accelerant, right? Think of it as gasoline, where, you know, if you have a pre-existing fire and you throw a lot of gasoline on it, it's going to explode. If there's no fire, and you throw gasoline on, you just have a mess, right? And as, as an environmentalist, don't go around throwing gasoline on your law on fire or no fire. That's not a great thing to do. But if you think about it, like, you know, southwestern, southern Ontario, for instance, you know, we've had this massive escalation of prices. But we didn't see that in Winnipeg. We didn't see that in Edmonton. 
and go back to to 08 09 you know london ontario you know, interest rates went to near zero we had you know money creation back then you know prices went down in london so you go okay well, well what's different between toronto and edmonton other than hockey teams, but I, I, I no, promise oh, I went. Yeah, 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 you knew I was going to go there. <laughs> yeah, you. Have, I went. I went there. Don't, don't, don't worry. As a Flames fan, I assure you that Edmonton will be joining Toronto very soon. If, Give uh, us time. Give us time. If they but, both win, because they don't play each other this round. If they both win, no, they, they, play, they, no, they do. Round. We got a right battle. Now, they're playing now. Battle yeah. of Alberta. Oh, oh, it's actually, gonna be it's gonna be it's epic. Gonna be wild. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's gonna, gonna be, be epic. But you could say, okay, well, what's the difference? Like, why? Because the interest rates are the same, you know, between Toronto and Edmonton. Um, you know, you know, white collar people who saved way too much money during the pandemic is the same between Toronto and Edmonton. Well, what's the difference? The difference is the the underlying housing shortage. That in Toronto, housing is a fan, you know, house prices in the shortage and prices going up 10, 15% a year attracts more money. And then, you know, what was a 15% increase turns into a 40% one. Whereas in Edmonton, it's like, okay, house prices aren't going up. So if I've got this extra cash, why would I put it in housing when I could go put it in, uh, you know, buy, uh, you know, buy oil futures, buy commodities, buy gold, you know, buy whatever, whatever your hedge of choice is, buy that instead. So that that's what you saw. So again, it's so yes, the the fuel matters and it matters a lot. But the but you need to have that pre existing fire, you need to have that pre existing shortage other otherwise, you know, otherwise, what happens is the same thing that happened in Edmonton or London, Ontario 12 years ago, that you know, the buyers get an incredible deal right but because they're buying into a buyer's market with with very low interest right so they get a great deal but it doesn't it doesn't cause a lot of price appreciation nick as we as we wrap here i just want to thank you for sharing the data that you do because it gives people especially that we work with a lot of confidence in their decision making because if you just look at the price point in and of itself it can be very scary to make mm -hmm. any decisions on real estate but what you are doing are giving people the framework and the context to make a confident decision and I think Canadians, we could all benefit from that, right? So, and, and whether we all agree or disagree with where real estate prices are possibly headed, at least with some of the data that you're sharing, we have some insights. It's not just a mystery, right? So I think we've always looked at the central bank interest rate policy as a very, something we can track and try to front run a little bit, yeah. to be frank. But mm -hmm. and the data around population has always been more difficult to really get well done. We were like, depending on Stats Canada forever, but then your reporting has really kind of dialed that in. So I just want to thank you for it. There's a bunch of us out here who, you know, love your charts with the font that you're using. <laughs> there we you go. share them and we always give credit to you, tell people to follow you on Twitter and that kind of thing. Um, and as we wrap here, Nick, I don't know if you have any more questions. Um, but uh, no, no, I, I guess there is one. If I can, yeah, I can see you more. have a question. You're like, yeah, Nick's like, yeah, no, I have one more question. No, before this, he leaves. this stuff is just so interesting to me because it, it's, uh, I've always been the type of person that I've I've always, for better or for worse, like sometimes I was in high school and tried to figure out the system yeah. in not so a good way. So I could maybe yeah. kind of skirt the rules sometimes, you know, so I, yeah. I, I like understanding how things, uh, how things kind of operate. So uh, to echo what Tom said, I really kind of value the effort you put into that stuff. So, so there's a lot of people that really benefit and appreciate all the stuff you do that for sure. I was just interested in what you see or any anything that's crossed your plate that's interesting versus the housing unit um the makeup of the housing units because when we look at yeah. the numbers um nationally and in ontario there's just been this big drop off in single families versus or low rise versus high rise and it seems like i don't see that recovering much it seems like for them to be able to reach the unit numbers they want it's really going to be high rise dwellings yeah. um, overtaking, like it's, it seems yeah. like the, the makeup of the typical, even how London, Ontario was built in the past, it's, yep. it's not gonna happen that way anymore just from, from the density because of how many units they need. Is that kind of in line with what you've seen? Or think? Yeah, and that's, and that's one thing I would be watching as you, know, you watch housing starts is you know, what, what's happening. So the CMHC usually tracks four types, single detached, semi, row, and uh, apartment. I think it's worth watching 
um, the the starts that happen and go, okay, where are the increases? Because the last little while, the increases have been mostly on the on the apartment side, and they don't they don't differentiate between high rise and low rise. But um, yeah, I, I think that's it. And I, I'm you know I would be quite sort of uh, bullish on on single detached and semi detached because I don't think you're going to get the construction that you need um, for for the sort of demand that that's out there that I think is only going to grow. And as well, I suspect, and I don't, you know, this is more conjecture than data, and I know we've been living in data, but, you know, what happened over the last couple of years with, with long-term care homes and things like that, I suspect you're going to have more aging in place. I don't think we're going to have the kind of generational mm -hmm. turnover that policymakers expect yeah, of that's interesting. Yeah. Se people in their mid to late 70s or older moving out. I think, I think you're going to have a lot more people staying in their you know, elderly people staying in their three to, to four uh, bedroom single detached home until till they're in their nineties. They might make Actually, a lot of they might make a lot of renos, but I think they're gonna I I I would make a bet that they're probably gonna stay. We just went through that exact point with my wife's mom, who yeah. didn't want to move into a place. It was kind of time for her, yeah. um, and she could afford it and everything, but she wanted to because of all the, the the different thing going on with the pandemic. She wanted a little bit more freedom to be in her own place. So you're right. I've never really thought about that point. That's a big I point. That, either. that is. Yeah. A well, I think I think it's important because again, go back to something I said earlier that when we when we design policy or when municipalities design policy and they do forecasts, the 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 thinking is usually okay i'm going to just extrapolate past trends right and go okay you know x percent of the population between ages 80 to 84 yeah. move out of their single detached home and move somewhere else i suspect that proportion is going to change and i think it's going to change downward i think you're going to see more more aging into place and if that happens then all of the sort of anticipated supply of of uh, pre or uh, pre-existing homes coming in the market, I think maybe smaller than than, than people expect. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting point too. Yeah, we'll watch that. So thank you for this. Um, where is well, we'll have links to your Twitter handle on the show notes and to your report that we've been referencing multiple times, including page twenty nine. If anyone's listening to this and wants to see housing for family formations versus uh, versus housing supply, page twenty nine of that report to me is really insightful. That, that's the smart. That's that's the the big one that was the smart uh, prosperity. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, on smartprosperity.ca. Baby needs a new home. That report. Yeah. And then you're um, also on, uh, where do you put your, your posts as well? Yeah. So uh, I have a medium account. So basically I have all, all my official stuff that I have sort of reviewed by uh, other academics and make sure it makes sense. Uh, I, I put on, you know, we publish at the Smart Prosperity Institute. I also have a medium page, just like a Mike P. Moffat, where it's more my sketching out sort of arguments where you know i'll post those on twitter and you know some people say this is great and some people say okay you're an and idiot and you need to think of xyz yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but but i actually find that you know you know uh, abuse aside i actually find that really really helpful so a lot of times i will just sketch out stuff i go okay this isn't ready for prime time but here's what I'm thinking on this, you know, can I get some feedback? So, so I publish that stuff there uh, again, uh, Mike P Moffat at uh, medium.com. So you can, you can check that out. Cool. So we'll link to all of those as well. So if you're driving and you can't remember this stuff, we'll totally link to all that. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it, Mike, please keep doing what you're doing. There's a bunch of us out here who really value it. So thank you. Um, anything else as we wrap that you want to share? Go flames, go. Oh, geez. There we go. That's it. There that's it. Go. That's all I got to say. Can we, can we edit that part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That part is completely edited out. Yeah, that's yeah, no gone. one heard that. No one heard that. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate this. Thank you. Thank, well, thank you. you. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms. <laughs>